good, brother. How are you? I'm good. I, I, I'm good despite <laughs> despite everything. I mean, we got it. We had a chance to have a little catch up earlier. Um, so right. Listen, just right off the top, you know, thank you so much uh, for doing this talk with me. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and also, you know, for your contributions, and and we're gonna go through through uh, the contributions um, over your uh, your career and stuff this evening. Right on, thank you. We're so, so the pleasure first, to be here. Uh, yeah, and and you have a lot of friends that are joining you tonight, so that's cool. Um, so I wanna I wanna turn this around so I could um, just kind of focus on reading your uh, your bio to folks, right? And um, or, or a short bio. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, Augustine Coffee, coffee. Forgive me, brother. <laughs> I'm so it's used to I know, I know. It's 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 both. I've I've learned to let them both exist. Okay, so. fair enough. No, I don't don't mean any disrespect. No, of, of uh, course not. Uh, born and based in Los Angeles and active in the Southern California graffiti scene since the mid '90s, Augustine Coffee works in painting, collage, and mural interventions. Coffee's fine art practice draws together the languages of graffiti's deconstructive lettering street culture, mechanical drafting, modern architecture, plunder phonics, and 1960s, 80s iconography. This practice of vintage futurism, as he has, as he has termed it, is central to Augustine Coffey's work. With its soft earth tones and heritage palette, its collages applications of the fugitive, fleeting material culture of a bygone era, Coffey's work brings the recent American past firmly into the current day. He, uh, he has recently in, uh, exhibited at Information Hashimoto Contemporary in New York City. Uh, Adventures, uh, his show Adventures in Tonality in Gallery Open Space in Paris. His exhibition Darkest Before Dawn Stone Space in London. And then in, uh, Inventory at Jonathan Levine Gallery in New York, amongst many others. Uh, I, I would also like to note... Um, that you have exhibited at the Getty Research Institute and okay. the ESM Museum of Art in Los Angeles. Um, and again, that, that, that little short uh, readout is just scratching the surface with you. Yeah. Fair enough, right? Fair enough. So, so that said, um, I want to get into um, you as a young man. Uh, and in and, and Los Angeles. And from what I know, uh, you come from a creative household. And um, I want to know how that influenced you as a kid. It influenced me greatly. Um, even beyond just the household, but the parents and their, their particular backgrounds and their particular like, creative direction where my mother was very, like, on set, went to UCLA, studied art. Unfortunately, they didn't get to pursue art for a living. My father's side was more of, like, a hustler, technical craftsman, pursued different crafts for the, the sake of craft, and then moved on to the next thing. So I definitely picked up both of their traits. One of the things you've mentioned to me was that uh, as a young kid in school, this is pre-graffiti, yeah. um, you are already creating art, and you mentioned something about the quality of materials that you work with. Right. Yeah, I think since basically like elementary, junior high, I've always been drawing, and I knew that I was getting a lot of attention for the kind of drawing I was doing, and I was kind of known as the kid that was, that's the guy, he's one of the best artists at the school. And I had an advantage because my mom had really quality art materials that, at the house, like the the Faber Castle colored pencils and the design markers were at the house already. So I was, I, was, I had access to those. My mom supported my creative, my artistic endeavor. And um, so I, yeah, I had that, I had that benefit. I'd always been interested in art. I didn't know if I was going to pursue it for a living, but I just kind of let the chips fall where they may. But I was, I was going in that direction. I knew this is the thing I was good at. I feel like this is the realm I'm going to go into. And then the introduction of like the graffiti arts like helped to solidify that in a way. How how did that first happen for you? 
it happened through like just moving to Palms, the West Los Angeles district in the mid eighties, um, 80, 85 that what the Challenger explosion was 86. So about 85, 86, 84 to 86. Um, and kids I skateboarded with, I was a street skater. So kids that I street skated with were very, um, were all very creative, very diverse backgrounds. And a lot of them wrote graffiti and wrote and, you know, weren't the best, but they were writers. They were my first introduction to that. There was also a cat that lived down the street from me on Keystone in Palms that was named Trait, who was also like, a, who was also been piecing, but also was a skater. And he was kind of like my introduction to underground hip hop and just piecing and lettering style. But then a few years later, I met these two brothers named Cuba and Gachas, these Cuban Cubanos that lived in Palms. And they were like, they helped to fuel that extension of me and supported my, my, my graffiti art, like practice for sure. And became like my partners in, in writing in the early years. What was the connection between skateboarding and graffiti for you? Looking back at it, I think skate, street skating had me, it gave me access to the street level and looking at like curbs and, and, and infrastructure differently as an obstacle to skate. And then the, the writing part of it kind of played in the same thing because you're looking at things like, oh, I can climb this fence to get to this telephone pole. And you can see that telephone pole from the 10 freeway kind of a thing. You, there was this idea of like being on the street level. Skating got me on the bus and traveling around with other skaters and meeting other young writers as well. So there was that parallel. And it was also because I was into art and I was into skateboard art. There was also that connection and it, yeah, it all, it all paralleled, it seemed. And at that time in the early nineties, the, the writing scene was really starting to blossom. Uh, you know, notably, yeah. you know, you had Risky out there and, and, yeah. and more, uh, the other thing, too, that was really interesting to me at that time was um, particularly the Hex and Slick battle. Um, right. Yes, it, yes, the battle, but it was, there was something very different in terms of, of painting, uh, in terms of what Tec Los Angeles was envisioning of itself, right? Yeah, techniques. I think L.A. always needed to kind of find its own space obviously from like the New York um, dynamic that was set, but we also being on the West coast had the, like the Bay area funk that was set <laughs> and LA kind of had to do its own kind of space to fit in. And um, I, I believe it did its thing for sure. And I think a lot of it hasn't been fully um, explored and historically kind of set in space, but um yeah, well, let, let, we'll explore this. We'll, we'll explore it tonight. Um, yeah, unless there's some you, of it. <laughs> some of it, right? Yeah, and and so you also mentioned again that connection, you know, with New York. You were influenced um, by Phase Two and his work, um, and uh, and Dondi. And, and so, what did these guys mean to you from such a such a distance? I felt like they came into play for me later on in my years. They weren't there in the initial form formula. I think later on when I became more mature in my, my, my art practice and, and mm -hmm. wanting to know more, they came into play and made a, and, and there was a, a kinship. I felt like, I felt like I would be able to communicate with these folks on a technical level. And I, unfortunately I never got to have that time with them. So I honor them and I honor the, the time they put into this craft and, you know, the, the foundations they set. But in terms of being an Angelino and an L.A. graffiti guy, you know, there were other levels of cats that were like more direct inspiration and folks that I even meet yet that were inspirational to me that I met later. But like whom? Like Axis, CBS. Well, I went to high school with him and Bose from CBS were very helpful for me in those very early beginnings. This is like 92, 93. Um, and then my writing partner, Gotchas from TPS, and we both got into TPS in 93 at the same time. When I got into TPS, JoJo was a big inspiration for me as well. Hey, can you tell us what the acronym TPS stands for? The private sector. The Explain Philly that jo a little bit. The private TPS was created by JoJo and Trickster and DJ Sony. And 
it was it was like a West Side crew, like a lot of folks that went to like very West Side. I mean, Brentwood High School and like Uni High kind of folks. And it was a like non-connected crew. It wasn't in CBS. It wasn't part of any other bigger crew. It was it's a smaller independent crew. And these folks were killing it at this time on the West Side in like 92, 93. And I can't remember how we lined in, but Gotcha's I think got in a few months before me. And I'm like, yo, I want to get, I want to be part of this. You and I are partners. I want to be part of this. So at that point, like I really was like, I need to s establish a name and I want to get, in this crew with you and, and be in a space where I can learn, be comfortable and practice and keep building up to like this point that I wanted to kind of get to this, this established kind of setting that I was trying to get to. So um, I, I, I want to know more about that because you, the way you establish yourself um, as, as recorded, it, yes, you did letters, but right. you actually love doing characters, and you were really well known for that. Yeah, um, most char most character guys become known as the character guy in their crew, and that ended up being a benefit to me because I can come to the wall with like a couple cans, and the homies be like, "Here's a couple cans. Do a character next to my piece," and I technically would be practicing, learning how my can control. And learning, like, do, be, be, being very minimal, using two to three colors to do, like, a quick character. I do some, like, fast cuts and just, you know, just add something to the production. Yeah. So let's it helped a lot. Sure. Let's talk about this production, right? They, oh, this, yeah. this is interesting because this, this really kind of, um, kind of epitomizes that moment for me in Los Angeles with the shift in how writers were using paint. Um, particularly around characters and color, the way you use color. Um, now, you did this character. Did you do the style piece next to it? No, JoJo did that piece. That was in a private wall. Um, the full piece of the private sector. JoJo did the letters. I did the character to the left. Um, my my interpretation of a B-boy character. And, um, yeah, and when you say the L.A. thing, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the highlights. Which um, yeah. Cool Boy and Slick were the ones that like, like solidified that, and then like Hex truly did like master it as well. Right. But yeah, that was the um, yeah. I think at this point, and there's a lot of stencil tip happening in this. I was very into the technical painting of stencil yes, tip when I when I learned that. Explain to our viewers what a stencil tip is. What for the, the stencil tip is basically when you deconstruct the cap of um, a spray can to the central core cap. And then you align a whole pinhole to where the spray nozzle sprays directly. And you can spray a very thin line and waste a lot of paint at the same time, but you can get a thin line out of this. And you can get all these details, which are very like airbrush-esque. But um, yeah, w at this particular space where I, was did, where I did this piece, I could experiment and explore and mess around and and like and get into that and yeah these pieces are where i was like i was i was experimenting with the stencil tip and you know axis cbs mirror cbs were those cats that i i looked up to that really like took that stencil tip thing to another so, like level so I tell was, me about your your artistic trajectory uh it seems w were you looking towards cartooning animation yeah <laughs> and, and that, that direction I was looking all over the place. You know, I was, I, I sent you this one because this is kind of definitive tail end of me doing the characters, the backgrounds. Like I went, I went, I went ham on this one here. This is probably 97, 98. And um, yeah, I did a full B-boy, full body boom box. I did backgrounds. I did mushrooms. I did clams. Like I did all these I had all this paint, I think, at the time, and I just went whole ham on everything on this and knew that, like, this is it. After this point, like, I'm phasing some of this out because, like, I felt like I got to a creative point. I got to do my jam, and then, like, I wanted to phase and chill. So it, it, It's interesting because the, 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 the st well, there are two things that I, I take note of that are, that are interesting to me. Uh, the boom box uh, gives it that that period piece to it. Um, and also the line quality uh, reminds me of Baudet. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I, it, very indirectly. Um, but yeah, there, for sure there's some of that. There's, yeah, again, like I say, I was that tail end where I just, I was like kind of fancy free. If I did something, I sketched up and felt like I wanted to do this and I got access to that one wall. And we, it was like one of the first permission walls I had gotten and I can kind of come back when I wanted to and I got to go in. So that's why I went off on that one and did everything that I think everything that I wanted to do, but everything I think others wanted to see for me. Awesome. Nice. So speaking, speaking of, of permission walls and stuff like this, <laughs> we, we, we're going to talk about this because I want to know more about Venice Beach uh, from that period because uh, Venice Beach was kind of the writer's bench of, uh, of that area um, where writers would go and paint. But right. tell me about this project and, and this mural. My recollection is that that was curated by ICU Art, and it was a permission project at the Venice Pit, like near the tail end of its years there. And a bunch of other crews submitted sketches and got set walls and got paint. What, got what, other, do crews, their... what other crews were there? CBS painted, AWR painted, I'm sure SHLODs painted. Um, again, I'm spacing, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure that's, that's a UTI painted as well. And I, I, I'm pretty sure I was in UTI at this time in 90. Yeah, this is 97. I got in in 95. So yeah, a lot of like, you know, a lot of crews got down that day. And it was interesting because it was one of these days where we all kind of got, we all got to get down, but generally when you go over there, it's sketchy. Scanning it uh, or painting at Venice was, that pit was always, you never knew. It was right. good, and it was bad. Right, and that's also, I, just to, to give people some background, because, uh, you know, there not only were there, you know, high, a lot of uh, gang activity in that period, also you had the Dogtown Boys that was still in that in that area as well. Yeah, yeah, that and Shoreline Crips and homeless folks, and yeah, it was a lot. It was, it was, it was sketchy. I yeah I and how 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 does a kid like you who's like coming into that their territory, well I guess this was legal. Did you ever go there kind of just on the on your own and just paint? I, I never went on my own. I always went with the crew. I always went with TPSs or my UTIs. Um, I never I never had a bad experience there. I got a chase out once. Belmont in um, downtown LA was a little more of a sketch and near like near fatal incidents happening there. But Venice, my experience at Venice was were, were good. They yes, weren't and, as terrible for, as others. Right. And for viewers that, that don't know Belmont, Belmont was a, a really special area to, uh, for, for writing culture and hip hop culture uh, yeah. in Los Angeles. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. The Belmont yard was one of those other former like train infrastructures that was just left abandoned and became this, like amazing mecca, perfect walls, perfect visibility. Um, yeah, it was just that was this amazing space, and it you know it it fell to what most places do in LA, come to like redevelopment, and we lost it. But um, no, it was a mecca, and it was it was also terrible because it was one of those points where we lost LA lost a lot of its yards. That was that last hurrah of a space venice around, was around gone what, what right what year would you say late early mm, fuck. early 2000s late 90s early 2000s we yeah. lost we lost belmont we lost venice and then what what ended up happening what what that like allergic reaction would be is Writers and crews started getting their own walls independently through business owners. Yards were gone pretty much. Right, after that. and and I, and I recall at that time because I was I was living out there for five years that, um, and I, I actually painted at Belmont with Slick and Doe's once, mm. uh, but Melrose was lit. Yo, yeah, yeah. That, Melrose that, was that other special place that kind of. Tell me about Melrose Avenue and why graffiti blossomed there amongst all these retail establishments. So Melrose, beyond graffiti, Melrose was a space where, like, there were, there were, like, punk rock boutiques there. There were, like, early, like, thrift store boutiques on Melrose before it became a graffiti mecca. 
now consider also you got Fairfax High right next to that space. Yeah. And a lot of writers from CBS, WCA, like TCF coming out of that space and the, we, we, with, being within that like two mile circumference, and then having the hip hop shop right next to that and then beat nonstop right next to that. that those all help solidify that. And especially solidifying it as being CBS, having some maintenance over these particular walls as well and still maintaining it like to this day. And that early um, kind of establishing relationships between the writers or that particular crew and these walls and like not, you just don't show up over there and paint. You talk to, you talk to someone, you talk to anger, you talk to a head to make yeah, sure yeah, you yeah. do that. That was, that was the thing. And that's why it's sort of still maintained. And, and again, that's still, that particular strip is still a space where people go for retail and to see what they call street art now. But, right, you know. right. And, and, and of, of course, some of the retail outlets, you know, supported writers. You know, you remember you had... Some uh, did, yeah. Ian points out Workman's Outlets, which I remember going in there and Fat yeah, Beat, of course. Fat Beat's for um, sure. So uh, kind of shifting, one. shifting gears a little bit, right? Because you, you, you've already at this point kind of, you know, getting really good at your painting and your, your lettering skills and... And you start to think about other things in terms of your creativity and your art, right? And you you start applying yourself in in, in kind of a different kind of form and format here in on wood, correct? That's yeah, that's acrylic on wood, for sure. So this here, what I find really interesting about this painting, coffee, is that. Um, you are kind of, uh, how do I put it, injecting little hints of graffiti, but also exploring fragmentation and space and movement. Um, and so tell me about what, what you're thinking about and looking at with this kind of work. That's 1999. That there was that period where like the late nineties to the two thousands were happening. And that millennial shift seemed like one of these, it's a split between, you know what I mean? It felt like this is a space where, okay, boom, we can move over and start flowing. This is the future. It's the two thousands now. You know what I mean? Like it's, and that was part of my psyche. There's the other aspect where like, yeah, like you mentioned, there's parts of graffiti. When, when you say that, when I hear it, I mean, that part of graffiti being the 2Ds, the outlines, the the shapes, the highlights, the flow of lettering, the connectivity. Like there's only one letter here. That's the K in white that I, I highlighted. And everything else is the the bits and the doodads breaking off of it that are just flowing off. Now imagine you focus fully on the fucking letter, but damn, imagine all the doodads. Like where, if they kept going, where would they go? that whole like flow and shift. And the other thing that's here are those two boxes. And there was this, I think that came out of comic book. Like when I started doing my character stuff, I always kind of put my characters in boxes because I couldn't finish the full bodies. So I would in encapsulate them in these spaces. So when you see that lower box, you see the shapes behind the box and then exploding out and then reconnecting to this other box, giving you fuck with three, four viewpoints, like, and then your imagination kind of takes play in the rest of it. Yeah. I, I, yeah, go ahead. I don't even own this piece anymore, but like, I've been looking for this. I don't know who has it. Like, I, I think I know who has it, but they haven't said they have it. Like, this was a definitive key piece. I have a terrible image of it. And I'm glad we get to speak on it because it is part of that 99 to 2000 shift where like, I was... Right. I was, I was exploring. I was experimenting. I was right. abstracting. And, 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 and it's important, right? Because now, you, you know, because as generally in graffiti, sometimes things feel very flat, even though, and you're always alluding to space and relationship yeah. forms in, in terms of relationships. One of the things that I learned from you today was the acronym of your name, which is apt to what we, <laughs> what we look at. No, and this is important. I, I find is. this to be really important to understand who you are. So your name is K-O-F-I-E. Uh, tell us what that acronym is. The acronym came up later, 
And when I realized it, it sort of made sense at this point. And that acronym is spelled with a K, clusters of fragments integrated evenly, K-O-F-I-E. So that was something that came up like later. Like most things I realize happen later. They don't, I do it, I do it. And then time goes by, I look back at it, I'm like, hmm, oh, whoa, whoa, that makes sense. So right, but it's- it, That it was the flow. Really Right, and it became evident in the work. So if we look at this mural, again. That's, yeah, the charismatic mural on Melrose and Van Ness. Um, charismatic was a boutique. The concept of the boutique was the treehouse endeavor. So, okay, treehouse, I'm going to paint roots on the side of the space, and that spells charismatic. So that gave me the um, structure of the letter form to break down. And they picked the color palette of browns and Later on, we're like, yo, we need to have a pop color. Here's red and pink. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm with it. And, um, yeah, I was sitting on a lot of that paint well after this production, and that paint ended up showing up in other work. And this helped to, like, kind of establish, like, this was one of those ones that, man, like, it, it what do you call it? Like, it was a turning point for sure, a sea change. Again, 2000. And, like, I got this full wall that Slick had painted previously with, uh, I don't know who else he painted it with, but previously Slick had painted this, and then it was buffed for a long time, and then I got it. So I knew that history on that wall, and I knew that this was this was something. And when I got the opportunity to do this, like, I went off, and that was also my first time using latex paint as a fill, and then only Krylon light anodized bronze as the outline in a tester tip only. So that was a very, like, um, it's very curated thing. Like, having that, that Krylon paint and this, like, Vista latex spray, like, um, buff paint. It was very unique to me. And it was also that part of that thing about 2000. Like, I'm going to establish this year, but this decade, this new decade on some, like, on some new shit. So it was an important well, piece. Right. And, and then you, you start exploring collage. Um, and this is really interesting to me because um, you, you see hints of, of, you know, kind of the, the, well, with the cars, you see this engineering, this, this, um, these kind of drafted technical drawings of the vehicle on the upper left. And then next yeah. to it, you see graffiti. Again, you start seeing some of the things we would see a little bit later in your work. Yeah. This was, yeah, a collage for a solo show I had at um, Frank Souza's gallery called 3D3 and a third. And um, this collage was parallel to a project I was working on that eventually turned into a clothing project called Draftsman that I did right. for about seven years. The cars being all utilitarian vehicles, the CJ30 Dreep, um, the um, International Harvester Scout, photos I had taken, yeah, very, um, I got up, I got all up into Rauschenberg at this point. And, um, that, the panel that's on is actually like a wood pallet I found in an alley. And I drag it up to my very small studio and do all these stencils and collage and just experiment. And then like, yo, I had a show. I'm going to throw it on the wall. It was very just like nonchalant. This is it. But so, this is early for the collage though. I mean, we'll obviously show like the. Right, Rogers. so you, you point towards Robert Rauschenberg's work, his collage and print work. Um, were you academically trained as an artist? I was not. I will, I will always honor my, the drafting class I took at Hamilton High School, the photography class I took at Hamilton, the marker techniques class I took at Santa Monica College, silk screening. And let's go animation. That, that, let's go back to that course you took on Santa Monica. <laughs> who, was, who was the uh, instructor? No, I can't. I don't even remember. I I should have asked Miner because I met Miner at that. We had that class together. Ah, okay. I didn't realize it till later. Miner WCA. Right. Um, I don't remember the professor, but it was an extension of Santa Monica College that was at the uh, Santa Monica Airport. And um, this is ninety two. Mm -hmm. Uh, 90, 93, 94, probably. Um, so, Kofi, I'm looking at this piece here from O2. And again, uh, uh, knowing your work today, um, and at, at this point, this is the time when you're doing the clothing line in Japan and everything, but you're kind of exploring uh, something different in terms of your 
you know, your work, these floating planes. Yeah. Um, of, of course, they, they, you know, they, they allude to things in history, but there's something new in it because it's done with spray paint and um, it's in public. Uh, what were you um, exploring at this point? I was exploring the space between doing like illegal graffiti, but doing it where it doesn't look illegal. And this was off of La Brea. That purple that's in this piece was already on the wall. And I came through, parked my Jeep Wagoneer right up against it, pulled out the latex, did all those green, green of fill-ins with the mini roller, outlined it with the light anodized bronze again, did my little highlights. And it was one of those things where I'm in and out. I, this was like about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. Like daytime illegal was what this was. And this was part of my like, Living in this, like, part of, like, Beverly and La Brea, I was living south of Melrose at the time, like, Wilshire District, and the, within this, like, five-mile radius, I was doing these daytime illegals, like, popping open my trunk and just knocking off these pieces, but all within the same era, like, around my house, like, shit where I eat, honestly. Yeah. Um, and it was this thing where, like, okay, look, I wanted these illegals, I don't want to do my name, but I want to do these shapes. They're relevant to this thing that like I'm sketching at the house. I'm doing these blocks, these doodads, bits, things, and like, and I'm I'm trying to do them in a flow. I love doing like 2Ds. I love doing highlights. How can I do it without writing my name? And this was like this way of doing it. And I kept doing it a few times. And I I did it like I did about like 25 or 30 of them, all within that radius. All these wood panels that would pop up on the street before the um, bills would come up, the advertisements. So part of that was me protesting advertisement um and also i admit at the same time espo came to la and did these rollers of his name but they were like on he did them where they look like graffiti buff i don't i don't even know if this has been discussed or anything but this he came to la and did this for a little while and we all were noticing him like what the fuck is this like that was super inspirational and on top of that Sinner LTS was doing these amazing pieces, elite, daytime illegal, same thing probably, where he was doing these portraits of like Latinx, like artists, and then his shapes around it. And some of those lasted forever. Like those were amazing. And those are part of like my inspirations on this. I'm like, okay, what? How can I do my daytime illegals? Keep it cool. I don't have a bunch of fucking hundred spray cans in front of me. Come in, in and out, do it quick and never get busted that was that was part of this whole aesthetic it was also part of the thing where like okay i love my graffiti piecing i love doing that but i want to try something different and experiment and this was my my space where i felt like i could do that and do it on my own and right this this painting says a lot to me about you and the you know the, the trajectory of of your your practice right so we're going to leapfrog a little bit but i'm going to come back sure. to it right because the element, all the elements are already there, right? It, they just it, roughly, yeah, for sure, they, they're not, there. They, they, you know, the color palette, the, the, the dynamics, and um, you know, you you arrive later on, <laughs> in, in, years later, in a, in a similar oh, place with your studio practice, and here is where we see you really, really tighten up um, a, a couple of yeah. things: uh, uh, signature, concept. Um, the uh, execution of your work um, and the color palette, right? Yeah. And, and how, sure. you, how you uh, it, you make uh, you activate a square uh, so dynamically and and, and, in, and in an interesting way, right? You, right. You, you you point to architecture, which is really interesting as a topography. Um, you know, it's almost like city planning, almost, isn't it? It is. I that was the the. That was the thing most people would comment on. They felt like they're looking at a city from above. I, I never saw it like that, but I, I understand that. Um, I, to tell you the truth, that the 45 degree, the isometric, came a lot out of um, Ed Moses. And his, like, he did this, oh, God, there's a series he did. I can't remember it. But Ed Moses did these paintings, another California artist, these very 45-degree isometric crisscrossing of, of ink. 
Yeah, I, I would. I should have studied it. Research that. Woo hoo! Yo, he's, he's that that's for sure one of those like, yo, this dude, and then like, yeah, that, and then also what that did to me is like, you got this plane, but then if you shift it like this, you got movement. There's automatically something happening, and now you got that crisscross. You use a 45 degree angle, and you can reconnect things and find things that weren't there before. Right. And then when you talk about the collage, now we're talking about found paper, found at estate sales, where I got a, a beautiful ex girlfriend of mine got me hooked on estate sales, and I was just I was going for audiophile stuff originally, cassettes, what have you, records, and then like, oh, there's paper. Whoa, what's this? All this aged, beautiful ephemera started getting used in my work, and the colors of that paper define the collage. And I tried my best to not re overpaint it. I let the paper be the color, and then I would highlight it with my my graffiti, my outlines, my highlights. You know, giving it the flow, like laying down a foundation of tile, and then giving it my my thing, my aesthetic over it. And with the collage, the drafted stuff was done more, it was more, um, it was more close knit. It was done in my home studio, done flat. It's very involved. It's very engineering kind of working where in contrast to that, the studio paintings in the wet studio are done on the wall. Right. Like the way I learned how to paint on a wall. I didn't learn right. how to paint flat. I learned how to paint vertically. So, so there's so these before, two dynamics. Right. So before I, we get to that, one of the things that's really interesting about this series at, at this point is that you want, this is really kind of the, the, really the kind of very defining of the term, the vintage futurism, because you also, yeah. again, part of finding the old objects and, and also framing them with old rulers. And mm -hmm. uh, that was just brilliant. And thank you, bud. I, 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 I really think that you kind of honed in on this, this um, kind of very uh, you know, definitive invention of yourself you know, as the draftsman, right? Um, and, and perhaps drafting a new future for us in painting, right? Where, mm -hmm. or, or, or even thinking about contemporary modernist graffiti. Um, and, and like you said, this, this is, these are two very different works from that similar period from the same and, show and, that, yeah right? that's the vintage and, and, futurism show in 09 yeah in london right and i want people no to in la that was the la show that's the la mm -hmm. uh, so i want people to understand you know like what they're looking at right because right. um you really have to pay attention to the details not just uh, the details of the shapes but the execution of the work yeah it's all detail everything was always detail oriented from when I was a kid drawing and illustrating to this point. And the detail always felt like it came at the, um, the ladder of the work, not in the beginning. The beginning was the, the physical, the flow, the execution, the, the process, the, you know, putting that paint to the wall. And then yeah. that time goes by, and then you get to do the detail. Yeah. And the, the fine tuning, detail and fine tuning come together. Highlights like in graffiti, highlights you do at the end. Like it's, that's when you like pull that motherfucker out. When you make right. this piece you did that you drafted with giving it 2Ds, you're making it three-dimensional. You're building something. And when you do those highlights, you're, you're at that fine point of pushing it out. So well, when I get on my things... detail point, like, that's the highlights are like the – I learned that from graffiti. That never left. Well, I, I, I was going to say another thing that you, you learned uh, about graffiti is proportionality in your work yeah. Um, yeah. and balance. Um, yeah. And, and you see that in, 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 in how you, like you said, the isometric directions and, and the relationship between one, one form uh, on one side of the canvas uh, to the other. But another thing that I'd note is that while this, and you know, I'm like a huge fan of modernism and it's, mm -hmm. it's been something I've chased all my life and studied and practiced. And wow, for sure, this, you did something, uh, you, you know, rather unusual, right? You took that and you injected pop into it. And that's unusual. And, and, and I don't use the word pop in kind of the, no. the Andy Warhol sense, more so perhaps, like you said, Rauschenberg, right? And, and, and so what we do here, right? You, you see this, all this modernist stuff, but if you look closely. Yeah. 
you see an automobile. You, you see a Jeep Grand Wagoneer, which is what I drove at the time. And you see the text Scorpio, which is what I am. This was this piece was called Self Portrait. And it was for a, a it was actually for a Scion exhibition in um, Culver City, California. And they're like, we want you to do a self portrait piece. I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is me. Those two were definitive at the time. And um, yeah, though, yeah, I get, I tell what you're saying. Like, there's that thing where like, I was always told in like, in like art practice, like when you start incorporating text and imagery, that's where the eye will go. And I wanted to make sure that in my work, your eye went to the structure and the abstraction and you tried to, to, to translate and define that. And then later on, you would see the text and the graphic and right. try to like correlate that with what I was trying to get you toward initially. So I, you know, again, not going to art school and knowing like traditional art practice. This was like sort of my own inter internal but, interpretation but of what I was going for. Uh, I'll share something with you because you, you are, you are falling in line with some of the theories of the early cubists and the futurists in terms of, um, you know, the visual picture and, and, and how that picture is broken up in space yeah. through line and, and, and color. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, in this part of our talk, uh, you know, the future is rooted in the past. You know, we dig, you know, I want to dig a little bit into that about these influences and these things that like speak to us uh, throughout our life and through our work. Uh, you had mentioned that you were, uh, you like Lee Bontecue's work. I, yeah, I didn't know about Lee Bontecue's work. Editor J.O.R. was like, yo, you need to go see this show right now at the, the Hammer. You need to, you need to see the show. I had no idea about Homegirl's work and it was just like flabbergasted. Yeah. And I, to this day, I still haven't gotten to the place where I've gotten to welding and incorporating fiber into welding. Like, I wanted to get there, but she just, woo, yeah. I, it's amazing. I, Especially I, I, in person. My God. I, 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 would, I would agree with you. I'm a fan of her work as well. Yeah. And of course, Brock and, and, and the Cubist, of course, he invented collage and Mm -hmm. uh, and Picasso joined him. And uh, uh, this one I chose because of the tonality and the breakup of shapes that kind of, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, I know. I see you. I see you, blood. I, I see that iron oxide and the turquoise and the highlights and the, the flow. Yes. And, 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 and I, I will tell you, I am I am ignorant to this piece. I do not know about it. I will just be fully, you know, transparent. Like I, I now that I see it, I fully understand why you connected it, but I am ignorant to right, the but artist also, in the form. So it, it goes back to something we were just discussing. Like you see it, but what do you see? Right? You have to investigate. That's what I love about the Cubists and 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 what they were kind of, um, uh, how they were engaging us, asking us to engage with their work a little deeper, right? Yeah, a little bit more right thought, right? Wow. Uh, and and of course, this one by Pablo the collage. Yeah. And which, again, speaks, <laughs> speaks to some of the work I've seen that you produce. But more yeah. importantly, because you're a music lover um, and, and in your work, you've injected musical notes. And I found this here and I was like, oh, yeah, that's interesting, right? It's amazing. And, the, the, imagine just the story of where that is from. And if you can even read notes, what that even says, there's more to that. The information in collaged material is almost as important as the collaging of it in itself. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, that's dope. What year is that, man? Um, 1920? No. Uh, well, it's, no, it's, it, I, I couldn't tell you the year, forgive me. But I, I've seen lots of his work over the years, and, 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 and he was really, like, although Brock really, um, you know, uh, created the art form, so to speak. He, yeah. He completely finessed it um, uh, in, in so many ways. And, you know, and of course, you, you know, th that connection to music, and that's really important to us, right? As artists, the, 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 the music in our heads, the music in our work, you're yeah. a huge music collector and lover. Make that connection for me. Um. 
Yeah, you no, know, my father and my mother had records. I've inherited some of those records. Um, music was always important to me. Hip hop was important to me because there was the connection between the old music and that, that vintage futurism thing comes up again where there's the sampling, there's the pulling from those old sounds, reinventing, reinterpreting, making new, making new music out of that. There's, there's that love for sure. Yes, um, and, and, and if I could get you to pause for a second because I chose the Thelonious for a very specific reason. Because there was a point in his career when he went completely wild style. He completely shifted how we were listening to music into kind of truly abstract music, really quite sophisticated. And completely everybody was shitting on him for that. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he lost favor because he wasn't Miles Davis, so to speak. Man, imagine, you already know how tough it is between the, the artist community in itself. You can imagine the jazz community in and of itself. Like that, especially those earlier eras, it's like you're... <laughs> You, and you've actually it's incorporated, you, you've actually, if I'm correct, you've incorporated, um, did I see this before? I feel like I've seen LPs or um, labels into your work. I've Yeah, the this, this solo, the you know, self-portrait piece you just showed previously had um, like the red that was in that was all Columbia Records um, sleeves. Um, yeah, right there. Oh, all, yeah. the, all the red in there, if you that. zoom in on that shit. It's all yeah, Columbia Records. Um, all right. Yeah, I've done other collage where I've used record, like record sleeves or record covers for my more um, um, press board collage pieces. Yeah, I'll I'll take I'll take whatever I feel could work as long as I know that I can like archive it and make it last a long time. And uh, oh, and Santa Leah. Yeah. So so it's not just music and and all art. It's architecture. And you introduced me to this this architect, and I I, I want to know more. I want to know why. I um I think I was at a show at Mocha downtown, and out of all these pieces, there was this very small piece from Antonio Santalia that was of one of these. It was his drawing of a um like a basically a water power plant, and I'm just like kind of getting into it. I was like, what is this? Is stunning. Took my little notebook out, wrote his name down. Some odd years later, after the internet comes to be, I got to dig a little bit more and research him and see that he's part of the futurism movement. He's this Italian artist that actually died in battle and never really got to like take it to where he felt he wanted to take it to. And then that led me into like the futurism movement, Italian futurism movement specifically, and their love of, you know, just you know, appreciating the machine and the art of the machine and the, the, the motor of what have you and like the, exactly. the progress and like stepping away from like, well, oh, this isn't art. This fucking, this engine is art or what have you. Like there was that kind of idea and like that me incorporating like the Jeeps and the machinery into my work was part of that kind of like honor of that. And um, yeah, but there was other parts of the futures of movement I wasn't like privy to. There was a lot of like, you're dealing with like, like, like war and like these kind of conceptual, like deeper concepts that weren't there. But I kind of I have to admit that I was a little more into like the visual part of it. Like this triggered something for me. And Centalia specifically in terms of futurism was like the guy I kind of went toward. And um this, this work that he made, the colored pencil, the illustration. And when we are, when you talk about architecture, like I didn't study architecture. I didn't study drafting. I took drafting in high school. Like it's, it's more of a, it's more of a direction and a, an aesthetic. And like when you talk about, when I say architecture, I don't mean like building, but I mean like the, the drafting of architecture, the, the, the drawing, the illustrating, the planning, all about planning. Not all planning comes to fruition. And I always related like graffiti lettering to being a draftsman. You're building these letters. You're going to build this painting. You're giving it 3Ds. That means it's supposed to come out of the wall. It's right. And but, but draftsmanship. Isn't there. it? Isn't it our 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 kind of a, a kind of a deeper em, our our emotional responses right to to these shapes to these forms 
that yeah. that, that really kind of inform us uh, in in terms of the the human capacity to create these wildly imaginative uh, buildings. Yeah, that, things that, that would that, never get built. But none of this know, got built, yo. Like of that brutalist stuff, like some of you know, like what right. Santalia did. None of it ever came to fruition, which I always find like it's heartbreaking in in essence, you know. And but there's this idea of the whole idea of like building to something. I really admire like the the concepts put right. into it. This brutalist uh, building is in Poland, and you and Nauer Nauer. Uh, collaborated on this, yes. and, and Europe, Europe is littered with great people. Littered, and 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 it's it, it's just so fascinating. Um, but you, you know, again, some of the great, uh, and and I'm going to share this with you because I I think you'll understand this a little bit in terms of our affinity for like the futurists and Cubists, those guys, those young men who are like peaking in their early ideas and career, and then all of a sudden war takes them. Right. And, and the heartbreak of that. Right. Of what that potential was. And yeah. and my affinity to that was what kind of um, helped me explore that space deeper, not just in, in art, but in architecture, music and other things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something in terms of like that, that kind of a revo revolutionary idea we have ourselves of, as a writer right about being uh fighting towards a personal future or a collective future in the culture right um, wow and, and we will go to whatever extent and and travel very far to do it and so in europe again you know the brutalist architecture is, is phenomenal but what i really like is your relationship to architecture right and how your your work plays with it and and this particular modern building in Los Angeles is really interesting. Uh, it, tell me a bit about this this project and how you you got into this project. Um, yeah, that's in Venice Beach at the the, the Wynwood Circle. I think I believe it's Wynwood Circle. And that building was built like in the early or mid '80s, and um, it was inspired originally by the old um, the roller coaster that used to be at Venice before like the POP was over at Venice, which, you know, that's a whole dog town history there. But yeah, um, at a certain point I was asked to like kind of paint the piece and do something there. And I was a little hesitant, but then I, that was one of the first opportunities I actually got to do something out of space where I knew a bit of the history at it. I knew kind of what they were going for. And I wanted to lay in, I wanted to lay down a, a mural in Venice that wasn't, so touristy that wasn't so like historical kind of Venice or what you expect, but honored a bit of more of like the, the, the modern buildings that were in Venice that have popped up since the eighties. That was my lay there. And then also some of the coloring was more inspired by the West coast and like the, the sunset, what have you, but the shapes were like definitive of what I was doing in 2012 and something minimal and not over overpowering. And I'll, I, every time I paint a wall like this, I want to paint it to where it holds up over the years. Not just like texturally, but just like style-wise. I don't want it to look dated. Is this still but existing? It's still there. It's still at that space, yeah. And it still looks pretty, pretty decent. It's still holding up. You know, one thought I've always had about you in, and your work is, is related to sculpture. And... Mm. Um, and the the opportunities there uh, with your work, um, and not just the, you, you know I mean I, I guess this is a, you know applied to 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 a sculpture surface, uh, right? But, um, I in a few slides coming up we'll see you apply yourself to to sculpture, but I'm I'm, I'm fascinated by that, um, and and again you know coming back to some of your um, your practice, right, where it's highly detailed. It is, and and this again, this is this is where I say that there's a grand feat going from this to this, right, right? and to be as uh, clean and balanced and and um, consistent. Uh, 
and and you do that and but you're also practicing this uh in in a time and space with others who share similar interests in in you know hard edge lines and modernism and, and mm -hmm. philosophy and theories um so uh you you're known for doing great collaborations uh, what is it about collaborating uh in outside of graffiti style writing uh to doing these contemporary murals i will tell you like after building with graph futurism movement i felt a little more of a kinship with folks that like thought outside of a box and we're in a space where if i propose something we're all sort of in agreement like oh yeah that's whoa that's good i like that like it you're, so you're was, experiment. Uh, excuse yeah, excuse me a second, but who was in agreement on this mural here? That mural was Remy and Kodak. That was the three of us together on this one. And the wall was buffed. We come to it. It's it's a clean space. We're like kind of figuring everything out. And we also got to think about like what was going on. I can't tell you what year it was. It was 2013, 20, no, 2015 maybe. Mm -hmm. And I was in downtown LA. That wall is gone. That whole block is gone. Um, and I know at the time... Like Kodak was exploring a bit more of the circular flow. Rem was where he's at. You could tell where Rem's at when it's definitive. And I had more of that 20, yeah, 2012, 2013 is when this was. And then my piece up on that upper left side was that half circle and on my shapes butt cutting down. It was more this to be like, you know, we all know what we do. Let's see what happens. We don't, we, we know what we have a, a rough idea. Okay. Kodak, you're going here. Yo, I'm going to do this circle. You work within that. Rem, you do your central area. We'll work off your lines. It's like, and we're like, cool. And, you know, the ego gets fucking left at the door. And everybody does what they do for the for the end result, the final piece. That's what speaking it's about. Of, speaking of ego, coffee, coffee <laughs> uh, I, I'm sorry, brother. I keep fucking up. Okay? No, but, no, you're not. I, the ego is what right. got me laughing. All right. You know, but, you know, speaking of ego, what were writers <laughs> thinking about your direction and your oh. kind of walking away from their com the comfort zone. Um, uh, look, my, my UTI boys, some of them were giving me shit, but I think it was just your general, like fucking with you shit. Um, like, but, but you know, Ace wasn't Warren, like Ace UTI and he, co he collaborated with, well, you. we're talking, we're, I'm, I'm talking about those early years when I was fucking around bringing like foam brushes and, one shot enamel to the wall to do my highlights in like foam brush and one shot and then splashing paint and homie saying like, Oh, why are you blessing the wall like that? I'm like, God, there's fucking with me, but they, you know, they dug it, but I, I, I felt comfortable doing it in those spaces. And I, you know, that's what let me do what I needed to do. You know, I didn't know I did my thing. I wasn't going to fuck the production up. Like, you know, they let me do my thing and get down and, so, but yeah, there was a little bit of here and there, but like, I didn't get, sometimes you get a little bit of the whole like, oh, you're, that's very loud. Well, you're being all European or something like, which is it's derogatory to me as far as I'm concerned. Like, nah, homie, like I'm, ex I'm exploring what I need to do. I am, I'm doing, I'm experimenting. I'm exploring. If you're saying I'm being European, you mean like, oh, well, I'm thinking outside of the box and expanding like my work? Like, well, okay, then that's what I'm doing. But, you know, our production is going to look hot, like regardless. And yeah, if you got I, one I, shot I, left, if you got one shot left in your film camera at the yard, you, they better take a picture of our production with that one shot left in your film camera. So that's right. where my thinking was. Like, I, I'm going to do and, my and, thing. And that, Right. It was you shared that thinking along with other people as well. And, and, and you know, infamously, you've done such beautiful work with El Mac, um, mm. you know, and, and, I, and I like this concept of kind of um, a, a, you know, the portrait and, and abstract and portrait. Yeah. Yo, no, not a lot of not a lot of folks were fucking with that back then. Like Mac and I were like, we're on that. I was doing it when I used to do live art. At a club called the Root Down, and I would paint portraits of like yeah, the musicians. I the Root Down. Yo, I was painting these like portraits of the musicians the DJs were playing, and I would do my sh like portraits, and then do my shapes around it. Like, yo, there was not a lot of dudes doing like abstract portraiture like back then. Like, so doing the thing with Mac was like it was like an easy thing to go into, and right. you know, it was it was a great painting with him, 
Um, I always, to this day, love him. And you, 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 and I, and and Remy, Alex, and Jabo, and and Juice. There's there's uh, there's a crew. Derm and Derm, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and timid and system, yeah, and and system. The, the 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 agents of change, um, is this loose collective we're a part of that explores these new ideas and shares some of these ideas about contemporary painting uh for towards the future and this project you've got you guys painted in london uh the, the megaro hotel is wild and it's, yeah, yeah it's, once i got out of the train station and saw this for the first time i could not believe you guys pulled this off yeah yo yeah and it's not step out of exterior, king's cross it's the interior as well yeah, no, there's there's works in the side as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so tell no. me about this project and the challenges. I mean, look at the architecture here and the challenges that present it for you. Yeah, no, after getting involved with like, you know, Graph Futures and projects, I got to meet Remy. I met Remy in 2010. And that was like my, he was like my in toward that, like for this project for sure. And when I got invited onto it, I wasn't even part of AOC at the time. I got in AOC at the while I was out there. Um, and it had it already laid out. Like, here's this space you get into. This is what we're going to do. I'm like, yo, there's no flat surfaces on this. I don't even know what you call this style of architecture, whatever. I, I, there's no flat. Like, yeah, this is going to be crazy. <laughs> like, all right. Um, so yeah, we, yeah, we were, we worked it out. It was all laid out. Everybody got to do their thing. And it was, it was mad casual. It was mad shows. It was no stress. It was great. It was well organized great folks that are going to be my friends forever. And I wish we can get more projects like this going. Like, yeah, you know, I, it's I like, would agree. yeah, there needs to be more of this stuff. stuff. Yeah. You know, but this set a precedent for me for sure. And it was, and it, you know, it's still there. You step out of that train at King's cross. It's like in your face. It smacks it's smacked. It's, it's so in your face and, and it's inside in it's beautiful as well. And yeah, they, it's a, they, they're lucky. I remember going in there and, and talking to the manager and saying, you know, you're very fortunate to have <laughs> these, these works on the inside, these, the paintings, the little collection yeah. they have. Um, well, I'm in Miami and, uh, you know, which has become a, a focal point of street art and, and graffiti art here with the Graffiti Museum. And mm -hmm. and uh, you came down here and, and did a big production. Uh, what what were your thoughts about Miami and the art, like this kind of uh, bustling place, bustling, hustling place for art? And well, that you, you are now part of the or engaged in the business and the market of art yeah that was the third time i was at art basel to paint something but the first time i got a large full-scale wall and also liked it because like montana put it together and graph futurism had a, like a say in it and it was like a um it was like a satellite to art basel and you know, I got I got to do my little get down. I actually painted two walls that time. But this is one of these ones where like, okay, now I get like you get it's like having a platform and a voice. You know, I got been there a few times, now I get a larger platform, so I'm gonna say something. And I, I said where where I was at at the time. And now, you know, those were these particular shapes I was exploring. Very um circulatory system, very post California soul. Um the, after meeting Jabo and um, and, and, and incorporating bitumen into my work and, and brushing in bitumen and paint thinner into it, and taking uh, my time. Uh, yeah, no. He he taught me how to use that, and it changed. Yeah, you, you know, we both like that antique look that the Cubists had. And yeah, sir. It, that that's the perfect medium. Yeah, that's but this is yeah, but that's the thing. I think this is one of these points where like, okay, we're gonna go off and like. There were a couple other heads painting around me that I wasn't. There were there was a bunch of homies that were there that I loved that I was painting with. There was a couple other there I wasn't really feeling, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna smash this, and hopefully, you know." I, I smashed like. On. I, I, I here pause there for a second because I really like what you're saying, right? That, that attitude, that mindset, and it's like it, it, it's a it's a mindset. Look, it's, it's a graffiti, it's a graffiti mindset. mindset. I'm gonna go out and burn. Right? Yeah, no, that's how it is. Blood. And yeah. kill everybody in the room on this one. And I mean, it, 
it, it's it's how how do I put? And I've often heard other writers be like, "Oh, this is not a battle." This, you know, they, and I'm like, <laughs> "All right, fine." It always is. You Yo. can be you could be sentimental that way. Just bring yeah. your A game if you have. It, it, but it's all like it's all unfair. It's all it's all funny. Yeah, it's of just course. Chill. It's not serious. so shifting gears. It's, be, it's b boy shit. Exactly. Uh, shifting gears. Um, you showed with David Block, and I, I went out there first with uh, the Agents of Change and had a mm -hmm. phenomenal experience. Yeah. And um, and with David, um, he loves <laughs> uh, modernism and 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 hard edge work and and high quality work, and yeah. he throws himself a hundred and ten percent behind his artists. And it's, he's a very interesting guy who who has some knowledge of graffiti, especially coming from from Europe. But he's he's a, he really pays attention, does his homework, and follows you as you develop and grow. So That's he true. gives you this show off the grid. Uh, and Morocco, as we discussed earlier, is such a special place. Uh, uh, it, it's so stimulating to all your senses. Um, and one of the things that David does. Uh, with artists, he encourages them to have full productions of the of their shows, including right. exterior, right? So now there's something being realized in your work that becomes architectural. Let, let's talk about that, about realizing that and stepping back from that. Yeah, well, each show that David has at that space, he has the artist do something on the outside surface. Some have gone and extended that wall to a higher space. Some have even done that. But I was like, okay, let's do this. Anything I'd asked for, David, like, made sure he got it together within days. So I was like, okay, here's my sketch. We need to build this shape out. We brought the wood. We marked it out. Someone cut it and built it up. I primed it, and then, boom, I did my thing. And, like, I did my thing at, like, that 30-degree angle and, and just played off of it. It was the first time I got to do something like that, which felt very, like, like like doing like a set painting for like a film, like a prop. It felt very like, because I've done that before being in LA and so my first work working in the film industry, like it felt like this kind of like, like, like a, like a theater kind of setup. Yeah, it, there's a yeah. staging. He completely yeah. stages the experience from the outside yeah. so to, to bring you in. Yeah, and we took it even further where I got to, I mean, that's one of the few shows where I got to go to a different country, have a solo show, and then go have time there. I got to do that in Cape Town when I had a solo show there. And this being my second experience in proper Africa um, and staying in, in, in Marrakesh and then going to explore, like, it's like, yo, I got to go to, like, the, the trash dumps or the metal metallurgy guys. Where are they at? Do a drive outside of town and can just hop out and just start collecting material. And then I did an installation on the inside of the, that show, too. And then even on top of that, doing the piece that we have displayed now, which one is a very traditional, like, metal shield, um, metallurgy punching out holes. And, you know, I got to visit that space, give them my design. And, you know, I, again, I was very, like, I was green it, when I how, brought how, the design. Like, yes, and, and how fascinating... Uh, to see that and experience that. I, I, I did that with Zephyr, and one of the things that's quite amazing, uh, and you saw it firsthand working with them, uh, they'll freestyle, and they have yeah. just muscle memory to bang this stuff out so quickly bang, and bang. beautifully. Yeah. And it's, it's really something special to watch, but also to participate in because, look, Ain't every day somebody like you, me, or any of these other artists walk through them doors. And the challenges you bring, especially with the kind of abstraction you like to make, uh, I could only imagine what they were saying amongst themselves. Like, what is this? Yeah, no, for sure. Like, what does it mean? You know, they're so used to doing a very set pattern. It's like kind of this consistent, consecutive thing. And then you come in and you're playing with their pattern. And then in shifting it a little bit, having them do what they normally do, but whoa, you're stopping and doing these straight lines where you're not supposed to do that, but okay, we'll, we'll do this. We'll try this out for you and see what happens. But yeah. Coffee, yeah. but isn't that, isn't that, isn't that hip hop? Isn't that the <laughs> remix? <laughs> right? It is. No, true indeed. 
It is. So, You're, yeah, it's the flip for sure. Like you know, it like, definitely is. And and yeah. so, um, let's leapfrog to where we are today with your new work. Uh, in recent time, you you are you you're kind of shifting gears. You mentioned that you're not making collages. Uh, you're not doing the, the drafting drawings anymore. Um, you're really focusing on improvisational painting um, and with different types of paint. Uh, tell me a bit of like why you are where you are right now. I think I wanted to, I wanted to step away from collage because I, personally it's, it's overwhelming. It, there's, a, there's a lot of collecting going on. There's a lot of material to it. Um, it's it's very like, mentally involved, and I kind of wanted to step out of it, and wanted to focus a lot more on just painting, like the the act of painting, and give all my attention to that. And um, yeah, we mentioned I stopped doing, I, a lot, I based a lot of my earlier paintings on illustrations. I felt very, I think it was a, the part of that graffiti thing in me, like oh, I did this sketch, oh, I got I got to paint this sketch, I love this shit. I had to step away from that and be like, yo, I need to go to the wall and just paint. Did that feel, did that feel like you were being a graphic designer? Uh, no, not directly. Partially, maybe. Um, no, it felt like I had it. I feel like I had this, like, plan, and it was working for a long time. Like, that's what it was. Like, I, I didn't want to break the formula. Up. Like, I being, I, I, if you look at all my earlier, like, character drawings, it's very technical. It's a pointillism. There's... There's detail. I've always been detail oriented. And I felt like the drawings I do were always so organic that I can translate that to a painting. And I wanted to see that. I drew this. I want to see a painting of it. And I just had to step away from that and, and focus on just freestyling. I let my gut speak and let what happens happen. And that's been happening for the last like two years or so. And again, or those earlier paintings, I used to freestyle those too. But again, I just stopped. Um, like a crutch of an illustration being the foundation of my organic paintings. I'm just freestyling my paintings. And right, and and you say freestyling, right? And it, and the 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 thing for me, it feel, it almost feels a bit of an oxymoron, so to speak, <laughs> right? Because it's so precise, right? It it the, is so so. Uh, it feels very. Uh, premeditated in some spaces and calculated and 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 yet it absolutely isn't yeah what i'll tell you is that there are pre premeditated um finishing yeah I, there's something going on i was going to mention for sure yeah the freestyle is just like letting the paint put the paint on the wall do it do it work 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 flow 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 then put it away bring it back later and then refine it the refining is already there it's already in my head I already have a direct direction to where it's going to go. And then I have a couple of my like particulars I go back to a lot of the boxes within boxes. And I pull up that straight edge and I fine tune and bring everything together until I start seeing it. And then it reveals itself. Um, but well, again, the kind of painting I do could just sort of keep going at a point. Well, I need to stop it. Yes. You know, and, that's where it's and, hard. And, and you, I, I will say this for those of us that know your work, there was also a shift um, a palette shift, uh, and your color, your color usage has shifted a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I dare I say you're happier. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, my theory early on was like, you know, I wanted to avoid everybody else is doing these pop pieces on the walls, on the streets. I'm going to do earth tones. I think that will help me stick out. And on top of that, my shapes and the way I approach shape would help me stick out, but I'm going to make these earth tones pop on you. And I just really stuck with that. And then slowly I was bringing in brighter colors, turquoises, violets, crimsons, oranges, like slowly turquoise was slowly coming in, but I would bring it in dull and then brighten it up. Yeah, but they but, serve um, a function. They, they serve, serve a, purpose, a function. Right? Because they, 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 uh, everything sits on, to on top of it. It seems elevated off of it. Yeah. And again, I'm always playing with, the push and the pull and making things look old and new. And when I start bringing these brighter colors in, it brings like a new breath and life in. And even if I'm, even if I'm playing with something that feels like bruised, like crimson purples, I can still make them pop and make it feel natural. I don't, 
I, I'm pretty sure I don't think I've ever put anything out there publicly that ever felt unnatural. All the coloring felt like righteous, solid, appropriate, and, and it made sense. If, for those that follow the trajectory from each of these solo shows where I make a collection, can see the color flow evolve and, and slowly come in. Like it was always about that. And, and, and it, so, so when we think about your work and where it's going, and you, you, you mentioned you have an upcoming show. Tell us about it and when and where. Next solo show is Hashimoto Contemporary NYC in um, early spring, April, May. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I forgot. I think it's April. Um, uh, having come up with the concept fully, I've been working on stuff and I'm getting there. And if I go concept, that means I come with a, I'm, I'm coming with a soundtrack like that I did, that I produced. I'm coming with a full, you know, full flow. Um, that'll be the next flow. A lot of things happened this whole last year. We've all kind of gone through it. Things got postponed. So I'm looking forward to sharing a collection, especially like domestically, because I've been showing internationally uh, for the last like eight years. <laughs> I've been, I've been showing in LA since 2012. Like I will LA a show for sure, but, um, but I'm happy to show domestically and Hashimoto is the next one um, for sure. So looking forward let, to that. Let me ask you a question about um, your practice during COVID. Um, what was that like for you? A, a little bit of tension, a little bit of feeling of um, like you kind of like your, you know, the rug got kind of swept under you. Um, you, you realize that you're um, a, you're not essential. Every, every space I needed to get supplies from was like, oh, we're closed. We're not essential. We can't do anything. So shit got shut down. So I had to work with what I had had. And I took advantage of the very mellow traffic in LA, driving down to the studio and just, and just hammering out and painting and not letting it really affect. I wasn't, I'm not that dude that's going to do like COVID paintings. I'm not, I don't do that. It'll show up somehow, like in colors or in like attitude or something. But um, to tell you the truth, most of the work I'd made in, during that first lockdown in Los Angeles are are gone and have sold, and they're they're out. They went out to the galleries. They did their thing. I didn't advertise them as like COVID era paintings or what have you. But it was it was sort of what was going on. And, you know, I talked to a couple other homies. They're like, "Yo." So you're either going to be like this guy that like just like boohoo's or you're going to be the guy that like, you know, you're going to learn like pro tools or something right now. You're going to you're going to take this time to like, you know, sh sharpen your blades and like exactly. work on this or video or prepare because this shit can't go on forever. We got to get through this. And when it was shit is done, be ready kind of thing. So I kind of took that route and I just kind of kept going. And again, I have a family over here and I was trying to make sure everything was safe and chill for them and i i sweated here and there a little bit but you know i i made it through i i onward up here you, you know one of the things that i often say to to painters or certain painters um at this point in their careers and their lives is to um take advantage of the energy the physical energy and creative energy you have to uh, do large-scale works again mm. uh, museum scale works again and, and particularly with you you know because if you look at your murals uh, just condense them down you know do them and roll it up put it away I call those insurance paintings when you think about and talk about family mm. and, and given the work that you do I think that's really important. But it's also, I think in the future, if I could project myself into the future, I imagine myself walk, walking into SF MoMA and here there's a 10 foot by 20 foot Kofi, um, that's just, uh, would be a phenomenal experience. Um, other other great artists have, have done that and we've been doing that since day one in terms mm -hmm. of large scale works and your work translates beautifully into that. So I hope you, you do that in for yourself. Uh, you, you know, there's the market, the market is the market. Market's the market. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and that is a really tricky place for, 
for us to navigate. And I'm, and I'm super yeah. happy that you've been navigating it and very cautiously and, 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 you know, at your pace, <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and it's, it's a, it's, it's a, mar- it's a marathon, not a sprint, so to speak. Uh, because you dil- as we all have seen today in this conversation, how diligent you've been in your process, um, and you didn't exploit the process. Uh, so, to yeah. speak. you know, you let yeah. that graduate from stage to stage. And it's beautiful. It's been beautiful to share this time with you and, and, you know, your story, your work, your contributions in the graffiti culture and in LA especially. But yeah. also that you push us forward. You pull us forward with these new works, right? You pull us forward with these new thoughts that you share with us. So I, I want to, on, on behalf of the museum and all our friends uh, who joined us tonight, uh, I want I want to thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I appreciate you. I appreciate the museum. Appreciate yes. everything you've done since you were a kid. Thank Ho- you. Hopefully, we, hopefully <laughs> there'll be a, a coffee show, a, a coffee, coffee and coffee show yeah. <laughs> at the, at the museum. You bring both your personalities. Whenever, yeah, and whenever you, whenever you call, I come. Thank Let's you, Mark. Do brother. that. I appreciate I appreciate, you. appreciate you, man. Love you. Peace Likewise. to your family. Likewise, stay safe. I Same mean, to you, fam. Well, we're, we're both in hot zones, so let's... Uh, yeah, newly hot. You, you know, and this is why this is important, right? right? That, you know, uh, when, you know, to have this kind of conversation is important for us in our lifetime. Um, yeah. and, and for me, especially because I've always been a, a fan of your work and curious about your work. Um, and so uh, to get to know it and be able to kind of explore it with you a bit is is great you know it's like you know like you know next time it'll be in the studio you know i went with my son to your studio and we had a beautiful yeah. time visiting mm-hmm. and uh that was really special so yeah for uh, sure same for until me until i see you next time my brother yes sir thank you boss thank appreciate you, you guys